evening good evening everyone um once again god has given us an opportunity to study his word and as we've been saying all along i think this is the most important book on earth in the history of the whole of the universe the bible is the most important book we were here this morning and we talked about something so so special the point we are making this weekend as we have done before is that this word is a single unit with a single theme and that is Jesus and him crucified and we found out from the bible that god in his wisdom had elected or chosen the israelites as a special people he uses the word peculiar in the bible and he gave them a peculiar mission too to achieve that mission god gave them a couple of uh, articles uh, he gave them the law he gave them the uh, testimony of the prophets and he gave them the sanctuary and we found out that really what god was doing in choosing or choosing this particular nation was to give us an object lesson of what he was to do in his son jesus christ a promise he makes in the book of genesis chapter 3 verse 15 and so this morning we looked at the feasts of israel there were seven feasts in a year we just looked at the first one, which was the Feast of the Passover. And we found out this morning that the Feast of the Passover was actually looking forward to Jesus Christ. Just like the Passover lamb, or the blood of the Passover lamb that was smeared on the doorpost of the Israelites, saved their firstborns and took them away from bondage of Egypt, so also the antitypical lamb, the antitypical Passover lamb, and that is Jesus Christ, by his blood, we are liberated from the bondage of sin. And we found out that God did not only for, you know, for, for, for talked about the coming of Jesus, gave us information, earlier information in this particular Israelite culture or practices. It was so, 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 so planned that even the time fell at the right time. And so we find Jesus dying on the very day of Pent uh, of uh, not Pentecost, very day of uh, Passover, on 14th day of the first month, at the right time in the evening, he died. And we figured out that this is so, so wonderful for God to have done this. It's like there is no question around it. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Everything the Israelites did in the Passover festivities were pointing to him. And so when he came, he died at exactly the right time. In fact, we saw this morning that at that particular time, there was a high priest in the sanctuary preparing to slaughter or kill the Passover lamb or a Passover lamb. And we found in the book of Matthew chapter 27 that when Christ died on the cross on the very day of the Passover, the priest was in the action of slaughtering the lamb in the temple and the curtain tore from top to bottom the knife fell from the high priest's hand and the little innocent lamb ran away because the type had made antitype, had made antitype on the cross. Now this evening we are going to look at the next feasts in a very quick manner. In the book of Leviticus chapter 23, Leviticus chapter 23 and verse um, 11, 23 verse 11. In the morning I made mention of three specific feasts that were carried out within a weekend like on the 14th day in verse 5 in the 14th day of the first month at evening the lord's passover we talked about that this morning and we found jesus fulfilling to the latter that particular time in verse 7 it says in the first day of verse 6 sorry verse 6 says and on the 15th day of the same month is a feast of unleavened bread unto the lord seven days you must eat unleavened bread the feast of the unleavened bread it says in verse 7, in the first day of the seven-day feast of unleavened bread, in the first day you will have an holy convocation, you shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is a holy convocation. And so it begs a question. We have seen Jesus fulfilling the fact that he is the antitype of the Passover lamb. How did he fulfill the feast of the unleavened bread and i just want to use jesus's own words in the book of uh, john chapter 6 verse 30 
So come with me to John chapter 6, verse 30. The Bible says in verse 30 of chapter 6, John, They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? So these people, the Israelites, who were listening to Jesus at this time, challenge him and tell him, Give us a sign, give us a miracle, so that we may believe that you are who you claim to be. In verse 30, they say, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And so Jesus reacts in verse 32. He says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Skip with me to verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Christ is introducing himself as the bread of life. I don't want to lose you. We are trying to find out how Jesus fulfills the fact that unleavened bread, the feast of the unleavened bread, was also a type of his coming and his mission. And so here he claims to be the bread of life. Verse 51 of the same book, John 6, 51, he says, Jesus says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And so he elaborates what he means when, say, when he says that he is the bread of life. He says that his body, which he shall give for the salvation of men, is the bread of life. And this is really important. And so we find Jesus claiming that his body is a bread of life, which he would give because of the sins of the world. And you just need to remember this morning, we talked about the crucifixion of Jesus, his death on the cross. Christ died on the cross as a sacrifice for men. And so that was on the day of Passover. Make reference to chapter 25, 23 of Leviticus and verse 16 and 17, the day that followed the Passover was referred to as the day of the, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jesus says that his body, which he will offer for the life of the world, is the bread. And we know that when Christ died on the cross, the next day, which was a Sabbath day, and we'll find that out, he actually rested in the tomb. His body was broken, and he was dead, and he laid there. He's telling us in verse 51 that that body, his flesh that he offered for the salvation of the whole world is the bread of life. What you need to ask yourself is how does the body of Jesus fulfill the condition of being unleavened? And we just need to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. I'll read verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice, and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so, when Jesus claims that his body is a bread of life, the body that he offers for the life of the world is a bread of life, that bread has to be unleavened. From this verse, we find out that the body needed to have none of sin. In other words, no malice, no wickedness, the bread of sincerity and truth. And we know that Jesus Christ was tempted as we are, based on the book of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, which says we have a high priest who is, is touched with our infirmities. Why? Because he was tempted like we are, yet without sin. And so Jesus Christ lay there, gave his holy, his clean, his sinless body as the unleavened bread of life, thus fulfilling the same feast that we've talked about. And so up to this extent, we find out that believing in Christ Jesus entails taking of his flesh and his blood. But that is not literal. Watch, chapter 6 of verse 52. Chapter 6 of John, verse 52. The same question lingered in some people's minds. It says in verse 52 of chapter 6, John, The Jews therefore strove upon themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh? to eat 
In verse 53 he says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat of my flesh, or the flesh of the Son, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live in the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread of life, which came down from heaven, not as your father did it manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. In fact, verse 63, he says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words which I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And so eating of the flesh of Jesus entails believing in him as the only propitiation for sin, believing in him as the only savior, but also obeying his word, living by his word, feeding on the spiritual bread, which is the word of Christ Jesus. And so what we are seeing as far as the feasts are concerned, Jesus is the Passover lamb and his body is the unleavened bread, the pure truth and sincere truth based on the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. And he fulfills that again to the latter. I just want to add this uh, reading to make that clearer. It says here, I am the bread of life. Christ represents himself under the similitude of heavenly bread. To eat of his flesh and to drink his blood means to receive him as a heaven-sent teacher, Belief in him is essential to spiritual life. Those who feast on the word never hunger, never thirst, never desire any higher or more exalted good. And so it's like Jesus is telling us that you need to believe in me and obey my word. As much as we feed on the word of God, like we have been doing for the last couple of months, we are actually feeding on the flesh of Jesus, the truth, the pure truth of the word of God. And so Christ fulfills the condition of being the unleavened bread. The feast of the unleavened bread was a type of his body, which is sinless, which does not have any leaven of sin that he offered for the life of the whole world. Now I'm going to reiterate the point I've made several times. Israel is only a special nation as long as they fulfill the will of the Father. They were lifted and, and chosen by God and given a specific work and duty. Given the law and the testimony and the sanctuary. And we found out last week that the sanctuary was actually the plan of salvation from the beginning to the end. We are finding out this weekend that the seven feasts of a year were also the plan of salvation from the beginning to the end. It's like God is telling us how he would save us from the bondage of sin and take us through a journey back into the most holy place, the very presence of our Heavenly Father. The sanctuary told us how that happens. The feast even bring it out in a clearer manner. And so Jesus is the Passover lamb and Jesus fulfills the feast of the unleavened bread because his body is sinless body, his body that he had victory over sin bearing he offers it for you and I. And feeding on that body does not make us cannibals. It means feeding on his word and understanding what he has to say for us. Now this takes us to the third feast, which is the feast of the sheep, first fruits, waving of the first fruits. And so this was a condition that God gave the children of Israel. I'll just read it from God's word, lest I say my own words. It says in chapter 23, verse 11, and he shall weave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall weave it. Remember I said in the morning that these feats took place in one weekend. On Friday, the 14th day of the first month was a Passover. That is when Christ died on time. We saw that this morning. The next day, based on verse 7 of chapter 23, on the 15th of Nisan, was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We have just seen that the body of Christ lay there as a sacrifice, as a body that he offers, unleavened with sin, 
does not have a living of sin. His pure body was offered for you and me as a sacrifice. And he's calling upon us to feed on that body and his blood. And we have said that he was not calling on us to be cannibals. No, he's asking us to feed on his word, to live by his principle. That when we do that, our lives would be stabilized in our walk back to the holy of the holies of our father. Now in verse 11 is the third feast, the feast of the first fruits. And so the Bible says, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And so Israelites expected a harvest. It was God's condition that before they took or partook of anything from their harvest, they had to bring a wave sheaf of the first fruits to the temple as a thanks offering to the Lord. And that was the first fruits waving of the sheaf as a ceremony or as a feast. In fact, verse 14, it says, And ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation in all your dwelling. And so before you partake of the harvest, ensure you take the first fruit and wave it before the Lord on the day after the Sabbath. In other words, we have the Passover. The next day we have the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And then the following day after the Sabbath, we have the Feast of the First Fruits. You ask me, what does it mean? Now here I want to deviate a little bit. Because we are talking about a harvest. The bottom line is that Israelites were not allowed to partake of the main harvest without waving the first fruits before the Lord on the day after the Sabbath. We have seen Jesus die on the day, Passover day, 14th of Nisan. We have seen his body lie down in the tomb on the next day as the unleavened bread to be partaken by the spiritual Israel. Are we going to see him coming out as a first fruit? What does it mean? Now come with me to the book of Mark chapter 4, just to build this a little bit. Mark chapter 4 verse 26. Mark 4 verse 26, the Bible says, And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground. Verse 27, And should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Verse 29, but when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he put it in the sickle because the harvest has come. We have just said that partaking of God's word is eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Now we find out here that the kingdom of God is as a, a person who planted and that seed grows to a point that it has the fruit and once it forms the fruit, harvest comes out. The seed in this parable is the word of God. The soil is your heart and my heart. We don't know how God's, work, God's word works. We don't know how his spirit does. But the word of God comes into our heart and makes changes that would lead to having fruit. And once the fruit is ready for harvesting, the harvest shall come. In fact, it is on this basis that Matthew chapter 13, verse 39. Matthew 13, verse 39. The Bible says, the enemy that sowed the bad seed is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. So even in our dispensation, there is an harvest or a harvest that is expected at the end of the world. And those who will do the harvesting are actually the angels. This harvest is as a result of God's word. This harvest is, is as a result of the message of our father. John chapter 5, John chapter 5, verse 24. John 5, verse 24. Sorry, John chapter 5, the 24th verse. The Bible says, John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come in condemnation, but is passed from death, unto life. Let me explain something for you, brothers and sisters. In the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible says, Wherefore, 
as by one man sin came into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for that all had sinned. By the fall of Adam in Eden, you and I were made sinners and therefore were condemned to death. All of us were dead in sin. In fact, that is what the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, and he hath, he, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And so all of us were dead in sin. But by the word of God, based on John 5, 24, by the word of God, all of us are raised from death to life. In fact, chapter 6 of the same book, John chapter 6, verse 54, the Bible says that whoso eateth my flesh, rather believes and follows my word, whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now notice, God gave us his word of salvation. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And by belief in that word, we have been, we have been promised life. In fact, John 11, 11, 25, even makes it clearer. John chapter 11, verse 25, my version says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live again. So there is a harvest that is going to come, and this harvest will come in terms of a resurrection. There is a major harvest that God is going to do at the end of time, where all that believe the word of God, even though they died, that God bore fruit in them, and the fruits have come to the level of maturity, and a harvest is going to be done by Jesus himself through the resurrection of those who believed his word. And so, in the typical service, on the third feast, the feast of waving the first fruit, the sheaves of barley were waved as the first fruit in lieu of a harvest that was to come. We are also expecting a harvest at the end of time. In fact, speaking about that harvest, Revelation chapter 14, verse 15, Revelation 14, verse 15, uses these words. Revelation 14, 15, the Bible says, and another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the clouds, thrust in the sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And so we are expecting a harvest. And what does that mean? A resurrection of those who lived feeding on the body of Christ. The resurrection of those who died believing the word of God. A resurrection of all who died in faith of the Son of God and of him as the Passover lamb, of him as the unleavened bread, and of him as the savior of the whole world. And that resurrection is referred to as a harvest. Now with that in mind, let's now see the feast of the ships. Chapter 23 of Leviticus, verse 11, has told us that they were to do this on the day after the Sabbath. 23rd of Leviticus, verse 11. It says, And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath the priest shall wave unto it. So look, watch. Friday, 14th of Nisan, Passover. Christ died on the cross in time. Sabbath, the next day. His body that is offered for the life of the world lies in the tomb as the unleavened bread. And he calls upon us to feed on his body and drink his blood. We have interpreted from the word of God that that actually means believing his promises, live, living by his word, understanding and believing his word, eating of the word of God. We have found that out. That's Sabbath. And then the Bible says that the third feast, waving of the first fruits of the sheaf, was done on the day after the Sabbath, and that Sunday. Now let's see. Did anything happen after the Sabbath 
on the weekend when Christ was crucified that would fit the description of waving the first fruits. We have seen from the Bible that there is a major harvest that is going to happen at the end of the world. We read in Matthew 13, 39, that the harvest is the end of the world and the harvesters are the angels. And we have seen that that harvest is actually resurrection. Christ says in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and life. And he that believes in him, in me, though he dies, he shall live again. There is a resurrection that is coming as a harvest of all that the seed of the word of God has wrought. And I hope that has made sense. And so we ask yourself, around the weekend that Jesus died on the cross, lay in the tomb on Saturday for three days, did he fulfill this particular feast? Was this feast also a type of something to do with Jesus? And I'm going to slow down now. Come with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Maybe before we go to John, we, let's start with Mark. Mark chapter 16, verse 1 to 4. Mark 16, 1 to 4, my version says, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Jesus was crucified on the Passover day, Friday. On Sabbath, his body lay in the tomb as the unliving bread. The next day after the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary come to the tomb, hoping to find the body of Jesus to anoint it. And very early in the morning, in the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. They found the stone that blocked the door of the tomb of Jesus had been rolled away. The main point I want you to get from chapter 16 of Mark is that, and when the Sabbath was passed. You remember, the feast of waving the first fruit was done on the day after the Sabbath, when the Sabbath was passed. Making the same point, Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. Matthew 28, verse 1. The Bible says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And so we find out, brothers and sisters, that when Jesus died on the cross on Friday, rested in the tomb on Sabbath, after the Sabbath, he actually resurrected. But look at what transpires a few minutes later. Now come with me to chapter 20. John chapter 20. John chapter 20 verse 1 and 2. The same thing. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and she and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Verse 2. Then she runneth and come to Simon Peter and to the other disciples who Jesus loved and said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. So these guys come to the tomb, specifically Mary comes to the tomb after the Sabbath and finds that the body of Jesus is missing in action. It's missing. And so he runs back to tell his people. They come and confirm that Jesus is actually not there. And then they go back. In fact, verse 7, verse 10, it says, Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Destitute, disappointed, someone has stolen the body of Jesus. They did not know that a resurrection has actually happened. Verse 11, But Mary stood within at the sepulchre, weeping, and she wept. She stood down, stooped down, and looked into the sepulchre. Verse 12, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the other one at the head, and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. So Mary notices something. There are two angels sitting at the point where Jesus' body had lain, one towards the head and one towards the leg. In verse 13, the Bible says, And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Verse 14, and when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew him, knew not that it was him. And so Jesus is around. Mary actually turns and sees him, but she doesn't know. Verse 15, it says, Jesus said unto her, woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposed, 
supposing him to be the gardener, say unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Mary still cannot identify this as Jesus. And she thinks it's a gardener and tells him, if you're hiding him somewhere, just show me, I'll take him away. And this verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus uses his voice to call her name and she knows without a question that this is her Lord, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus said unto her, and though she went, she went, you know, she went to embrace him. Because this is Jesus, he's resurrected. Mary wanted to touch him, to embrace him. Notice the words of Jesus. Jesus said unto him, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Jesus has resurrected from the dead. Remember, there is a harvest coming at the end of the world. And that harvest involved resurrecting the people who believe the word of God. But at this point, we find Jesus resurrecting from the dead and then telling Mary, don't touch me because I've not gone to my father. Are you already seeing something, brothers and sisters? He actually goes to the father. Why does he go to the father? Watch. It says here, joyfully, Mary hastened to the disciples with the good news. Jesus quickly ascended to his father to hear from his lips that he accepted the sacrifice and to receive all power in heaven and upon earth. So immediately after the resurrection from the dead, Jesus deems his feet to show himself before God in the sanctuary in heaven before he does anything. Why does he do that? Because he knows that his word is going to rout a major harvest at the end of time. But to fulfill the mission, to fulfill the type, for the type to meet antitype, Jesus goes to heaven and shows himself as the first fruit amongst the dead. If you think I'm making this up, right on time, Jesus appeared before God himself. He appears before the sanctuary of the Lord himself and waves his life, resurrected life, as the first fruits of those who are dead. Someone may think I'm making this up. Let's read it in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says in verse 20, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, the Bible says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. Jesus has become the first fruit of the dead. Like the resurrection of Jesus was actually a first fruit of the harvest that was to come. And just like we saw in the feasts, the Passover on 14th of Nisan, the unleavened bread on 15th of Nisan, and then the waving sheaves on the day after the Sabbath, right on time, the day after the Sabbath, Jesus resurrects from the dead as the first fruits amongst the dead. Now listen. Verse 20, 22 it says, Let me just go, verse 20, we read verse 20, verse 21 says, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So the resurrection of Jesus is the first fruit of the major resurrection that is going to be done at the end of time. Verse 23, But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. What is Paul saying in verse 23, brothers and sisters? The resurrection of Jesus was the first fruits of the major harvest. The resurrection of the saints at the second coming of Jesus will be the harvest. Before that harvest is 
taken partaken of, the first fruit has to be waved. So Jesus appeared before God as the first fruit amongst the dead. Thus fulfilling the type. So he is not only the Passover lamb. He is not only the unleavened bread. Jesus is also the first fruit amongst the dead. He is the first to be harvested from the life world of the dead as a first fruit. And this happened right on time. Passover death on Friday, unleavened bread on Sabbath, and first fruit appearing before God on Sunday, the first day of the week. And we know that he actually appeared before God and had power because when he came back, to earth after that action in Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 he makes this statement Matthew 28 verse 13 Jesus makes this verse 19 sorry Jesus makes this this statement Matthew 28 verse 18 and Jesus came and spake unto them saying all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth he went immediately before any interaction with past anyone he went back to heaven presented himself and he wanted to hear if we could just go back to the slide we read just go back to the previous slide Jesus wanted to make sure that God has accepted his offering listen to these brothers joyfully Mary hastened to the disciples with the good news but Jesus quickly ascended to his father to hear from the lips of his father that he had accepted the sacrifice and to receive all power in heaven and earth. And we can know for sure that Jesus received power and God accepted the first fruit from the dead. Now look at the next slide. The Passover was followed by seven days feast of unleavened bread. On the second day of the feast, the first fruit of the year's harvest, a sheaf of barley, was presented before the Lord. Listen, all the ceremonies of the feasts were types of the work of Christ. The deliverance of Israel from Egypt was an object lesson of the redemption, which the Passover was intended to keep in memory. The slain lamb, the unleavened bread, the sheaf of first fruits represented the Savior. This is a wonderful truth, brothers and sisters. So Jesus presents himself before God as the first fruit, the Passover lamb, the unleavened bread, and the first fruits from the dead are all representations of Jesus Christ and his ministry. All. In his ministry. In closing for this evening, let's look at the feast, the fourth feast, chapter 23 and verse 15. The Bible says, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall they shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days. And ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Ye shall bring out of your habitation two loaves of two tenths deals. They shall be fine flour and they shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits of the Lord. Now, did you hear that, brothers and sisters? From the day after the Sabbath, count seven Sabbath. In other words, Passover, 14th Friday, unleavened bread, Sabbath. The wave shift Sunday. Then after that Sunday, count 50 days and another set of first fruits would be brought before the Lord. Another set of first fruits would be brought before the Lord. We know that exactly 50 days after the ascent of Jesus, exactly 50 days, the children of God, the disciples of God received the Holy Spirit. Exactly 50 days came the Feast of Pentecost. And it happened just like that, without any deviation. So we see that all the feasts of Israelites were actually pointing to Jesus Christ. And then you ask me, if Jesus is the first fruit, 
presented at his resurrection, went to heaven, presented the wave shift, came back with power, stayed for about 40 days with people, and then 50 days later, the children of God received the Holy Spirit. But we are told that there's another set of first fruits that were to be brought before the Lord 50 days after the wave shift. Who are these? Matthew 27, verse 50. Matthew 27, verse 50. Matthew 27, there we go, verse 50. It says in verse 50 of chapter 27 of Matthew, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up his ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake and rocks rent. Verse 52, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Did you hear that? When Christ died on the cross, there was a major earthquake. The Bible says graves were opened and the bodies of the saints arose, but they did not come out until when Jesus had resurrected because it had to be the first fruit. What point am I making from the Bible? There are a set of saints that resurrected and came out of their graves and were seen by many people. This uh, is the team that 50 days later, Jesus ascends to heaven with as a set of the second set or the second set of the first fruit. Watch what the prophet says over this. It says, as Christ ascends while in the act of blessing his disciples during his ascension, an army of angels encycle him as a cloud. Christ takes with him the multitudes of captives as his trophy. He will, he will himself bring to the Father the first fruits of them that slept to present them to God as an assurance that he is conqueror over death and the grave. Exactly 50 days later, Jesus takes to heaven those who resurrected when he died on the cross as the first fruit and as a confirmation of him conquering death. But the harvest is not yet. Now in conclusion, brothers and sisters, we have looked at four feasts of the Israelites. The feast of the Passover pointed to Jesus as the Passover lamb of God that takes away the sins of the whole world. The feast of unleavened bread pointed to the body of Jesus, the broken body of Jesus, without any living of sin. The feast of the wave shift pointed to Jesus Christ as the first fruits from among the dead. And the feast of the Pentecost pointed to the time when Jesus was anointed as the high priest in heaven after presenting another set of first fruits of those who died and resurrected at his death. And it is that anointing that flew down to the disciples and falling on them as the spirit of the Lord of tongues of fire when they started speaking in tongues. 50 days after the wave shift, just as it was done in the feasts. And so let me make this conclusion by looking at these slides. We see that Jesus, in looking or coming to seek for us, left the most holy place came out of the temple, straight into the camp, and lived a perfect life among sinners. And then, as if showing us what to do for us to live the sinful nature, for us to live the sinful life, and win the bondage of sin, he shows us or demonstrates in the feasts what steps we ought to take to get us back into the holy place, most holy place. I will repeat. Christ came as an, not just as a savior, but as an example. He left the most holy place, came all the way to the camp, and lived amongst us a righteous life. After fulfilling that, it showed us what we ought to do, the steps we ought to go through to go back to the most holy place of the Father in the heavenly sanctuary. <coughs> Excuse me. And so in summary, what are we trying to say? So Jesus actually comes to earth and shows us the path 
And this is what he means when he shows us the path. Look, Jesus tells us through the feasts, for you to go back to the most holy place, in other words, for you to be brought into unity with God in the very presence of God, you must leave the camp and sacrifice everything on the altar of the cross. You must resurrect from the dead through the ordinance of baptism. And then you must follow Jesus into the most the holy place. And we will talk about this next time. And then eventually we will follow Jesus into the most holy place. And so notice that the feasts of Israelites were actually an explanation of the sanctuary message. Jesus comes and dies on the cross, the altar of the cross. He shows us, goes through the lever of baptism. He resurrects. And we know from the book of First uh, Romans chapter 6 that baptism is actually a symbol of death and resurrection. Let me just read chapter 6 as we close. Romans chapter 6. It says in verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. The feasts that God gave to the Israelites were an object lesson, an object lesson of how salvation works. I repeat, the feasts that were given to the Israelites, just like the sanctuary, were actually an object lesson on how God saves us. He says, you must lay your all on the altar of the cross. Kill self. No wonder Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Kill yourself at the altar of the cross and then feed on the unleavened bread of God, the word of God. Be guided by the word of God. Partake of the death and resurrection of God in baptism. And then follow Jesus into the holy place of the sanctuary. And we will see what he wants us to do at this point before it takes us back into the very presence of God. Friends, do you see how God in his plan, do you see how God in his salvation plan ensured that we were, for lack of a better word, like saturated with the message of the gospel? He appoints a whole nation of Israel and gives them the law, gives them the testimony, gives them the sanctuary, gives them the feasts, and all these things are pointing to one person, Jesus and his saving plan. And so in one year, the seventh feast of the year actually demonstrated the plan of salvation from the beginning to the end. And as well as the services at the sanctuary, the annual, or the whole year, the services at the sanctuary from the beginning, the daily and the annual service, pointed to the plan of salvation. Israel was an object lesson of salvation as offered in Jesus Christ. The whole nation was a type of Jesus. Their economy, their culture, their way of life pointed to nothing but Jesus as the Savior. I know we have done four feasts. There are three more. The Feast of the Trumpets, the Feast of the Day of Atonement, as well as the tabernacle feast of the tabernacle we are handling things tomorrow or part of this tomorrow come with me and continue seeing how god used israel as an object lesson as a book to be read by the nation to show that he the creator is god and he is the only savior we will come to a point and ask ourselves a question did israel fulfill that mission of being an object lesson to expose, for lack of a better word, God as God, and to demonstrate God as the Savior. Everything about the Israelites pointed at Jesus as the Savior. May the Lord bless you for being with us this evening. And we still seek your help, because people need to know the Lord. Share these videos. Make notes. Copy if you can give it to the world do not repeat my mistake because i didn't tell you earlier may the lord bless you as we continue studying i welcome you tomorrow 
as we look into the performance of Israelites as far as that mission is concerned, even after God gave them everything they needed to fulfill their mission on earth. May God bless you as we pray. Father, we thank you and praise your name, Holy God, for your loving kindness, for giving us another opportunity to listen to you, to read your word, to study your word, and to learn of you. Thank you for confirming to us that the Bible is a unit with a single theme, and that is Jesus and him crucified. May you help us bring this out in our feeble language, Lord God, that your children may see you in a better light as a loving, caring God who gave everything to ensure that we knew how we would, ought to be saved. May you abide with us and everyone who listens, either live or even as a recording, Lord God, may you touch them by your grace and teach them to believe you with all of their hearts. Help us not to let anyone derail us from a thus says the Lord, and that we may peg everything we believe on your word, for we ask this believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. See you tomorrow.